normally I can control the lights in this room from this like this uh, console right here. And today, for whatever reason, I can't. Um, so this one is probably a little bit better. This screen is probably a little bit better than that screen because this has got like a light just right on top of it. So there's nothing we can do about the light. We just have to kind of deal with it. Um, but you, you guys might want to, if you're having trouble seeing that screen, then crowd over here, I guess. Um, so the other uh, announcement I have is mostly for people on the wait list. So if you're on the wait list because we kept it open late, you have to fill in this form, which has to be signed by a whole bunch of people. Let's see, it looks like your advisor, associate dean, department head, provost, university president, senator, Barack Obama. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of things that have to get signed here. Um, you can get started with this piece of paper. I've already signed all these. Um, so, uh, so come on up. Uh, either now or after the class. Um, okay. Um, so that's it for uh, uh, starting announcements. Uh, so are, are there any questions about the assignments or anything like that? Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you get anything out of what? Um, so you can put Python objects in a view. Um, so if you want to put your own defined Python object, right, as opposed to like the kind of built-in things like a tuple or a dictionary or a string or, you know, an integer, the primitive types, built-in types, um, then you have to do a little bit of extra work. So the issue um, is when you write, when you read things in, when you write things out to a view and you read things in on disk, they have to get serialized. So they have to get written out somehow, okay? The way they're written out by default, there's a built-in function called, a Python called REPR, which is supposed to print out a readable representation of an object. Um, but then when you read it back in again, it uses a very limited deserialization process because we don't want to just sort of use any arbitrary like user code without sort of, that's sort of a security hole. So um, if you look at the uh, online documents, there's a little example of how to put your own Python object in there. But yeah, you can put a large object in if you want. Um, the, um, the, the, there are some OSs that will have problems with very, very long lines. If you're running this on Hadoop, that shouldn't be any problem. Um, but uh, yeah, it's okay. All right. I don't think the assignments that uh, we have out now actually require you to do any of that. Um, uh, but you know, it's it's possible. Okay. Um, so uh, so again, if you're just walking in and you're on the wait list, there's a form to get started with up here. Um, so I. Uh, Yesterday I started talking about um, Spark. Um, so a little later on in this class, uh, there's going to be um, an assignment which is going to involve using Spark. Um, so this is going to be redone from last year. Um, so last year we had an assignment that, uh, last couple of years we had an assignment which was basically implementing a matrix factorization method, distributed matrix factorization in Spark. Um, it was kind of okay. It's a little bit of a complicated algorithm. It uses a lot of Spark. Um, so the first year it was kind of too hard. Last year we basically gave people a lot of starter code and people said, yeah, that was a little bit unsatisfying because I feel like I couldn't have done it without all the starter code. So we're going to redo the Spark assignment this year. We haven't quite decided what it might, what it might be. Um, but there will be a chance to sort of try out Spark. Um, so uh, 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 that's, that will be coming. Um, so uh, Spark uh, is basically designed to um, um, improve on Hadoop by eliminating some of the key limitations. So we've talked about some of these. If you just look at kind of the Hadoop MapReduce raw interface, um, it's efficient. Uh, it's, easy to distribute things. Um, uh, 
it's a little bit low level, so we've talked about some higher level data flow type operations that basically float on top of MapReduce and get translated into MapReduce operations. Okay, so this makes it much easier to describe a complex al algorithm that requires a lot of MapReduce steps. Um, but um, there's still some inefficiencies, which I pointed out when we were talking about k-means and um, the page rank algorithm. So those are iterative operations, and when we iterate, we have to read um, in and then write out a graph every time for page rank, or in the case of means you have to k means you have to read in and then write out the whole data set. All right, so that is not efficient. Um, uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to store things in memory so you can loop over them many times. Um, so uh, it, the key idea in Spark is that um, sharded files, um, the, the data structure that you kind of use in sort of the, um, the base of all these, um, uh, um, these uh, MapReduce uh, systems, are replaced by something called a resilient distributed data set. Um, so uh, the RDD is really just like a sharded file. Um, you know, there are a bunch of objects that you can stream through. Um, it's distributed over um, the cluster. Um, there's redundancy that's involved. But the thing that's different is these are, these are cached in cluster memory. Um, uh, so uh, they're stored in memory. Now, of course, when things are stored in memory, there's also an issue because um, uh, you know, disks go down not infrequently, but you know, it's not that common that disks fail. Um, but memory is like a, a kind of shared resource. Um, uh, if you have something in memory, you better be able to sort of take it out of memory and put it back in again. Um, and uh, you better be able to recover from failures. Um, so uh, so uh, associated with every RDD, it's basically sort of the chain of operations you needed to create it so you can reconstruct it um, from something on disk if you need to. Uh, so an RDD is basically, you know, a, you can think of it as the materialization of a guinea pig view, um, but it has the, op you have the option of asking for it to be stored in memory. All right, so here's an example. Um, so, uh, so this is some Spark code. Um, so we, we have an RDD called errors. Um, we start out, we read a text file, we do some filter, filtering, so we're looking for all the lines that say error. So this is processing some big log file. Um, and there are a bunch of things we can do. We can count the errors, we can filter and find the SQL errors, and so on and so forth, okay? So um, in Spark, there's a um, distinction. Um, oh, I guess I should start off by saying API. So in the Python API, you first create this thing called the Spark context object, all right? Um, and um, then your pipeline basically starts with that Spark context object, all right? So this is a text file that's, that's created, generated relative to that um, context. And um, the way you construct a chain of operations, right, a, a workflow, is you basically add these little um, uh, um, methods to the end of it, okay? So there are basically, um, basically two types of these methods, okay? Uh, one type of uh, method is called a transformation in Spark, okay? So um, what a transformation does is it basically takes one data structure which explains how to produce or how to transform, how to generate some data, okay? And then elaborates that description. Uh, so this is, this is basically going from one data structure to another, and these are small data structures. This is like the query plan that um, pig constructs or the view definition in guinea pig, okay? So when you go from this thing to this thing, right, when you, when you, when you go text file filter, you haven't actually done anything, right? You've basically just said, well, first you're gonna read things off disk, then we're gonna do some filtering, okay? And you can have like a long chain of these transformations. They'll sort of happen one at a time, but nothing will actually get executed, right? Until one of these things. So this is an action. So there are a different set of things that are called actions. The actions are often, but not necessarily like reduced steps, okay? So this basically says, um, we're gonna count these things. That's an action. It will take this errors object, which is a description of how to find all the lines that contain the substring error. Um, 
and uh, it will return an integer, which will be the number of things this the, that contains. Okay. Um, uh, and um, uh, here's another uh, action. All right, we're going to filter these things and then count them. Here's another action. We're going to filter out a different set of things, and then collect them. So collect is an action which returns the um, the set of things that would be gener that are generated by that view. It actually produces that set and returns it as you know, a collection class in Java if you're using the Java API or as a collection in Python. So this will maybe probably give you a list of uh, lines here. OK. Um, so uh, this is actually somewhat inefficient um, because I, if I execute these operations one, two, three like this, then I'm going to loop over the full set of errors well, I'm going to loop over the text file. The first time I'm going to take this errors object, which basically scans through the files and pulls out just the ones that are called that are tagged with, that are, have the error string in it, and it'll tell me how many there are. Then here I'm going to take that same transformation. I'm going to enhance it with another transformation. It's going to do another filtering, and it's going to count that. So this is going to involve another scan over all the lines. Okay. Filtering out first the errors, then the MySQL lines, all right, and then the count, right? And then here we're going to do that same thing one more time to collect the results, all right? So this is the semantics of Spark. They're transformations which are lazy. They're actions which are basically just done whenever they happen. Um, this is an example of a transformation. This is an example of an action. This is another action, okay? So, um, uh, and again, all of these things are sharded, so this can be a distributed operation. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to make this more efficient, uh, what you need to do is you need to introduce caching. Right. So here we're scanning over those error lines, not the original text file, just the error lines. Okay. Multiple times. Um, so uh, what we might want to do is we might might th put this code in here. So this is basically saying uh, to hint to Spark that whenever I produce errors, okay, this doesn't actually generate anything, but basically materialize this view, try and cache it in memory. All right, it's not, a, it's not a, it'll be cached in memory. If there's memory around, it's, it's possible that it'll cache in memory. If it can't, it might have to kind of take it off disk or take parts of it off disk, okay? So if you cache things in memory, then um, subsequent operations will be a lot faster, so these things will, um, basically fly because you're not scanning through this big text file and pulling out a small part of it. Um, so subsequent actions will be um, uh, faster. So it's, it's important to remember where all this is happening. All right. So everything is sharded. All right. The computations get done on a worker machine. Okay. And the char and the worker machines have local data. So in Hadoop, they have these local copies of each shard. Um, and that's what the mappers run over. They run on local disk, right? Remember the whole game here is we want to have lots of disks to throw at this so we can scan through lots of data quickly. Um, so here it's the same game, but um, we also really want to have lots of memory um, because we want these shards to be stored in the local memory of the worker machines, okay, if possible. All right. So that's the basic idea. Um, so uh, there's another operation which is very much like caching but doesn't involve memory. Okay, we can also persist something. So I could say errors.persist instead of errors.cache. So persist is sort of the same thing, except instead of trying to put things in memory, it will put things on disk. Okay, um, so this basically means that when I re-execute these things, it'll go back to the persisted um, uh, object here. So it's as if we explicitly stored it and then pulled it out again. But it's a little bit nicer than that because we have more provenance information if there's error we have to recover. Um, so persist saves it on disk. Cache saves it in memory. There are a few other operations that give you a little bit more over control of that. Um, so it's, it's not trying to be smart about what it's going to persist. It's basically asking you to do that. Okay. So this is basically the way Spark works uh, in outline. Um, here's, here's the traditional word count example. Uh, 
So we're going to take uh, a text file, we'll go through and we're going to split each line into words, all right? Uh, this is using the Python API, okay? Uh, and we're going to construct a, a transformation, which basically will take every line and apply this function, right? And then flatten things. So we're going to end up with a list of tokens, all right? Then we're going to come up with um, this other operation, which is going to replace every token with a pair, which is a word and a, the count one, all right? Um, then we're going to do a reduce. So um, uh, in, uh, in, in Spark, there's a special data structure um, which is uh, basically an RDD, which contains key value pairs, all right? So in Hadoop, key values pairs are basically everything that you pass around. In Spark, you might, you don't have to, here we can just pass around lines. We don't have to introduce some arbitrary, you know, thing to be the key for that line, the way we did in Hadoop. Um, but um, uh, there are key value pairs, and it's sort of a kind of special, um, uh, type of object in, um, in the Spark world, and their special operations. So reduced by key is applied to a key value um, RDD, all right? And um, this basically means we're going to group by the key, which is the first thing here, okay? And um, we're going to sum up the values, okay? So this is the word count example um, uh, in the API, the Python API for Spark. Um, so um, uh, in this, basically, uh, if you were to execute this interactively, nothing would happen here, nothing would happen here, except sort of definitions, right? So you'd be defining this view. When you say, I'd like to save the counts as a text file, then that action would happen, all right? Okay, so the reduces are just another transformation on the key value pairs, okay? Um, all right, um, so um, here's another of the kind of classic examples for Spark. Actually, are there questions before I move on? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so here's another example. So um, this is an iterative algorithm and it's logistic regression, okay? So this is how you would do um, logistic regression in Spark. Um, uh, let's see, let's kind of talk through. So here we're taking these text files um, and uh, we're, um, we're parsing these, okay? So we're basically creating labeled um, examples here, okay, with this routine parse point, which I haven't shown, all right? And then uh, I'm caching that, so that hopefully will be stored in memory, okay? Um, so, so this is a Python package called NumPy. How many people know about NumPy or have used NumPy? Okay, a lot of us, okay. So NumPy is a, is a, a package that lets you um, do numerical processing, um, primarily we, in machine learning, we use it for vectors and matrix um, operations, okay? So um, when we're looping over these points, okay, we have a function of a P that we're going to do in our map phase, all right? And um, uh, W and P are vectors from the NumPy package, all right? Um, so NumPy lets you overload operators, so this star, uh, is um, multiplication, uh, uh, this, um, uh, and sometimes it's vector multiplication, so here it's multiplying by scalars, here it's multiplying um, a scalar by a vector, so Y is the label for that point, okay? Um, uh, dot is dot product, okay? So this basically is the math, you know, a concise description of the math that tells you how to find the gradient of a logistic regression classifier that's defined by a set of weights W on a vector X, all right, or P dot X, all right. So this is basically computing the gradient, all right, so that's what it returns. So we end up with um, a bunch of gradients. The gradients are actually vectors, okay, so there's a gradient for each component of the, the weight vector W telling you how to change that particular weight, 
All right. So we're loop over all the points. We'll compute all those gradients. Um, and then at the end of the day, we'll add them all up. So that gives us a gradient over the whole um, uh, data set. So we're doing sort of batch uh, operation here. And then we, uh, we basically um, adjust w. Um, it's the gradient to the loss. So we're going to want to push it in the other direction. Um, in real life, there would also be a learning rate here. Okay, So this is just updating it by the gradient, which is a little bit extreme. Um, and we're just going to iterate this until we converge, uh, or in this case, just for some fixed number of operations. All right. So let's kind of think about what's happening here. Um, uh, so reduce is an action. It's going to produce a NumPy vector. And it's going to return that to um, the gradient. Okay. So each time we, uh, we step through here, we're going to um, you know, distribute our computation through the cluster. Okay. We're going to get back you know, this. Um, we're going to construct these gradients in sort of this map phase, and then we're going to add them up. All right. And that will eventually get aggregated back here um, at the uh, calling thing. So we'll get you know, just one gradient vector. And I can use that now to update w. So, uh, so this is using NumPy. And that's sort of doing actually two things for us, um, which I'll kind of mention a little bit now. And we'll kind of come back to later. Um, so uh, NumPy matrices and vectors are um, doing two things. One is they let us describe this math very compactly. Okay. Um, the other thing they do, uh, and it's, it's compact um, you know, syntactically. I don't have to sort of type a lot to do that. Okay. But these are also relatively compact ways of storing the data. Okay. So a NumPy vector is basically you know, a C vector with a little bit of meta information. Okay. Um, a NumPy matrix is basically you know, a C matrix with some, a little bit of meta information. And when you call things like dot product, you're calling you know, optimized routines. Um, uh, so in uh, uh, a system like this, uh, you're basically doing, um, uh, you're spending most of your time on manipulating the actual matrices and vet vectors. OK, here I guess it's all vectors. But you're spending most of your time doing matrix manipulations, um, vector manipulations. And you know, using the right package, you can do that using sort of optimized C code. All right? And then there's a little bit of logic around that. So here we've got a loop. OK, and of course, there's all the logic involved in doing the, you know, distributing the operation. OK, this is actually pretty efficient. So this is much more efficient than sort of like writing code yourself in Python, right, using the sort of built-in Python data structures. OK, so there's sort of two advantages to getting to this sort of representation. One is it's concise, and the other one is it's, it's actually likely to be faster um, and, you know, more memory efficient. Um, so there's one other thing that's going on here, which is a little bit uh, uh, um, hard to notice. Um, so this map here is a function of two things. It's a function of the point, but it also depends on the weight vector. OK? Um, so the weight vector is used in this um, function, all right? But it's actually you know, defined out here, and it's updated out here, OK? So what's going on with that, right? So when we execute this, where is w, right? So it kind of needs to be two places, right? So w needs to be in this driving program, OK? When you do the reduce and you get back the gradient, you need to be able to update w, OK? But w also needs to be um, in the function that's executed. That function is executed on the worker programs, OK? So w has to somehow be shared with the worker programs. OK? So um, what uh, happens in Python, the, the name for this is actually called a closure. When I've got a function that has some variables that are, are defined sort of in the local scope of that function, all right? So they're defined outside the function but used inside that, all right? Then what Python and you know, every kind of similar functional language does is it builds an object which is you know, a compiled version of that function that um, includes the current value of w. All right? And that's the thing that, char that Spark is going to ship off to each worker. All right? if, this is a, if this is a large 
um, uh, weight vector, um, then what happens is every time Spark uh, calls this um, gradient computation, okay, whenever it does this map reduce step, what it should be doing is it should be taking the current value of W, redistributing it to all the um, workers, okay. Um, and of course, here the workers are just reading it, okay. Um, there's nothing that stops you from writing code where the workers modify W, all right. And if you do that, um, your code will be wrong, okay. The workers will modify it, but they'll only modify their local copy. Okay, so any modifications the workers do, they're doing it with their copy of W, all right? So Spark is, Spark is smart and it will, it, will, it will distribute those copies around, okay? Um, but that copy is only, you know, distributed in one direction. It's only sent out to the workers, okay? It's never, it's never brought back and collected because how would you even do that? I mean, there could be all sorts of inconsistent changes, right? So, uh, so this works basically, the kind of short story is, Whatever you um, distribute using this scheme uh, is, um, has better be read-only. Okay. Um, and again, the other thing that's going on here that's important is we've cached the data in memory. All right, so when we loop over it, we're looping over memory instead of looping over disk, and that's faster. All right. So how much faster? Here's some experiments. Um, so uh, what you see here is with Hadoop, as you increase the number of, of iterations, things grow pretty much linearly, and they grow linearly pretty quickly, all right? If you look at Spark, the, the, um, the timing in terms of the number of iterations is much, much smaller, okay? So this is what Spark basically buys you. Uh, any questions? Yeah? What happens if the data can't fit inside memory? Well, if the data can't fit inside of memory, then Spark will fail to cache it. Okay, um, so um, usually that's sort of a soft failure. So you'll see a warning, but you won't see an error. Um, and um, it will try and, you know, swap things into memory as much as it can. All right. So this is part of why what it caches in memory has got to have a definition to it. Um, so um, uh, there's a, I don't remember the name, but there's basically um, some options, I think, to persist, right? which will tell you, give you a little bit more control about what it does, whether it's going to actually raise an error or whether it's going to um, uh, uh, you know, raise a warning or just sort of passively do nothing. Um, so um, uh, the caching isn't, isn't you know, sort of a contract. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a request, okay? And obviously these are cases where you could fit in memory, otherwise we wouldn't see these beautiful speed ups. Yeah. Um, where's the value of W? W be updated for each point, I mean for each iteration on each machine? Yes. So what happens here is in each iteration when we, um, when we execute this action, okay, so when we do the reduce, okay, we're going to look at that, um, we're going to rebuild that closure, okay, um, we're going to send the function that's going to be executed to the workers, and that function includes the definition of W, the current definition of W, right? And then it'll sort of proceed from there. I have to my opinion that the uh, update for one point A is very quick, right? Uh, and can be done in a very short time. So how does different machines synchronize their value W? Ah, right, right, right. So how do we synchronize all these operations? Well, this is basically doing batch gradient descent, right? So we're taking the sum of the gradient. No, the W doesn't change until after you've like look, looked at all the gradients and summed those. It's not doing stochastic gradient descent. Okay. If you want to do stochastic gradient descent, it gets a lot more complicated. I uh, does it say so? This is batch gradient logistic regression. It's bat, batch gradient, not stochastic gradient. Okay. When we talk about this later on, I mean, like a couple, uh, next week or something, we're going to talk about stochastic gradient descent. So um, what we're talking about here, basically, there are some advantages to basically updating that weight vector, you know, locally whenever you get like a new piece of the gradient. Um, so uh, that's often a better learning algorithm. So this isn't the optimal learning algorithm. It's just sort of an example of how you can sort of distribute things easily. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's a good question. So, um,
That's a good question. Um, uh, let me double check that. I'm not really, I may have misspoken here, right? Um, uh, yeah, this stuff isn't as fresh in my head as it ought to be. Um, No, 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 it's much simpler than that. I mean, there are a set of things that are marked as actions and there are a set of things that are marked as um, uh, transformations. So, you know, each method, it's either a transformation or it's an action, right? And the question is, did I get it kind of mixed up here, right? So, um, this is definitely a, um, I, um, I, well, I guess it's not, yeah, this is definitely an action, right? Because you're actually creating a vector here, which is um, being used here. Um, there's no action here. You're just looking at the variable, right? So why did I say this is an action? Why did I say this is a transformation? Uh, so I don't know. Does anyone, uh, maybe one of the TAs wants to check up on that like quickly and sort of see if I've gotten that mixed up. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is my bad. This is something that's actually really important to know when you're messing with Spark, so you have to, um, I, I really should know this. Okay. Um, so, uh, I guess another thing I want to mention is that, you know, Spark um, has a bunch of libraries built on top of it. It's got a pretty nice graph processing library. It's a pretty nice machine learning library. Um, so, there's sort of lots of things that are built on top of Spark nowadays. Um, okay. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, uh, some other MapReduce frameworks. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but this just sort of gave you a sense for what other things people are using. Um, so uh, cascading is another flavor, and there are several other types of things that kind of have this flavor. So it's basically an API instead of a language for writing these workflows. So it's sort of a J Java API that lets you do some of the things that um, are in PIG. Um, so here's a, here's a little example, and I apologize if people in the back can't quite read this. Um, so, um, so the first thing we're doing here is we're defining our inputs and outputs. So this is similar to what we do um, in uh, specifying a, um, you know, a, uh, um, uh, the um, inputs and outputs of a you know, Java MapReduce program. All right, so we're saying we've got these objects called text line, so it has you know, a set of fields um, which have these names, okay? Um, uh, so this is basically specifying the input and the output format, okay? And they're gonna get bound to um, places on uh, HDFS, all right? Um, so uh, then we're gonna construct our workflow object, all right? So each of these things are basically, um, you know, like transformations in Spark. We're describing what the computation is gonna be, so, um, this is a regular expression, and this thing here basically specifies something that's going to generate um, uh, uh, tokens for a line. Okay, so we're going to take that function, we're going to apply it to everything in my my pipe. So at each point, we're sort of adding something new to that um, to that that uh, that pipe. All right, so we apply this function to the line field. All right, and then we're going to group by this stream of tuples. Okay, and the regex generator is sort of um, the thing which does the flattening here. Okay, um, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to aggregate these group values. So we have this aggregator operation. All right, so that's a that's a grouping operation which count these things up. All right, um, uh, and now finally we're going to set up some properties. So flow.complete is when we actually input this um, uh, task and, and have it be executed. So this is word count in um, uh, cascading, all right? And there are other things that are sort of like this where you define a pipeline of tasks declaratively. Um, there'll be some optimization. Um, and uh, when you invoke some operation on your, the assembly that you constructed is when the final execution happens, all right? And of course, for all these things, the key thing is, you know, how well does the system do at hiding the details from you? 
Um, so, you know, you really what's going to happen. Is the system going to explicitly form a group for each word and then count the elements? Or is it going to fold those computations together or not, right? So the devils are in the details, you know, as to whether it, um, the optimization is going to save you or not, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, so cascading is a Java version. Um, uh, there's something called pipes, which is uh, similar for um, uh, that, but it's in C++. If for some uh, sort of strange and and um, uh, masochistic reason you prefer programming in C++. Um, so um, uh, if if you're younger and uh, more adventurous, there's something called scalding, which is basically like cascading, but it's in Scala, which is another. It's built on the JVM, but it's a very concise language. Um, Here's some other things we talked about pig, so that's definitely an example. There's also there's something called Hive, which is closely related to pig, but it's a little bit more query language like. So it's kind of a cross between pig and SQL, if you like. Um, so this is an example of uh, a word count example in Hive. Um, so there's an interesting system that came about out about a year ago, which is in many ways like Spark, but prettier. I'm not sure if it's gonna um, take over, but it's a pretty nice system. This is a word count from the, um, uh, the Flink project. Uh, so um, uh, this is the, this is the um, Scala API. So Scala looks a little bit like Java, uh, like, um, like Python. Um, so um, uh, what we're basically doing here is we're, um, uh, taking our text, which is, you know, some sort of generator string, so it's not, it's not, not anything big, but we could take it from a, like an HGFS file system or something instead. Um, and um, we um, construct this thing here, which basically does a flat map of the tokenized, tokenized version, then it adds a little one at the end, it groups by zero, which is basically the first element of the tuple, so it's grouping by the key, then it's summing things up. So these are um, the uh, this is this is the kind of standard word count map reduce, all right. Um, and um, uh, at the end of it, we're going to do a print, okay. And um, in this situation, nothing is actually going to happen until we execute things in the environment, all right. So um, Flink is even lazier than Spark, um, and it's lazier than Spark for a good reason, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. This is. This is the same um, program, but using a Java API. So Java APIs are a little bit um, more uh, bulky, but uh, uh, it's not too different. Okay. Um, uh, and again, you know, Flink has got um, it's got a couple of different um, bindings. Um, it's got a couple of different um, kind of clusters and storage systems that can talk to at the back. Um, it runs pretty nicely in a local setting. Um, so one thing that's nice about Flink is it actually contains operations for iteration. All right. So in Spark, once you start iterating, you know the optimizations can't look inside that iteration. All right. Um, so uh, in Flink, it is possible for it to, you know, recognize some sort of some common computation, let's say, and pull it out. So there's a little bit more opportunity for optimization here. Um, uh, so uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty system. I don't know if it doesn't have the the. It's kind of starting behind uh, Spark in terms of the user base and the number of um, uh, um, uh, the number of things that are built on top of it. Um, okay. So are there questions about Spark, Flink, cascading things like that? Again, this just sort of give you a little bit of a feel for what's out there. Uh, one more, I'm gonna, now going to go back and talk about one more algorithm. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in MapReduce. So this will be like the last MapReduce algorithm we sort of like dive into in depth. All right. So this is um, an algorithm that was put together by a couple of my friends, uh, Takashi and, and Matt Hurst. Um, uh, these are their profile pictures when I put these slides together a couple of years ago. This is, this is more what Matt looks like, actually. It wasn't a great picture of him. Um, so here's the basic idea. Um, they're working for a company that basically did consumer analysis. And what you wanted to do is um, uh, build a tool that you know, would 
take a whole bunch of online comments about some product, um, find out what people were talking about. So what were the sort of interesting op, um, uh, items of discussion, and um, try and you know do things like look for trends and you know do sentiment analysis and so on and so forth. Um, so, so one of the things they looked at was this idea of finding phrases. These are, uh, this is kind of a list of things. You can sort of see there's some things that people talk about, like fuel cell, hybrid cars, battery packs, tour to soul, the Jetta, you know, some, uh, some competitive things. Talking about, let's say, steering wheel, right, or the key sense wire, if you are the guy that's responsible for, you know, customer support and understanding what's going on in the, in the space. Um, so this is an interesting problem for a lot of reasons. Um, there are lots of phrases. It's not a supervised pro data problem, so there isn't any kind of clear signal that you're trying to estimate. Um, it's a little bit hard to articulate. Um, uh, you know, when is a phrase, you know, meaningful as a phrase? When does it make sense to say, well, this is a phrase, right? This tells you something like, you know, test drive or red meat. Um, whereas just R lots is probably not a very interesting phrase, even if it's a common bigram in the corpus. Okay, um, and the other thing is what makes it, you know, interesting, what makes it relevant to that domain. So uh, this is uh, kind of, an, you know, here for two reasons. One, it's a nice algorithm to talk about um, uh, as, you know, a MapReduce test case. And it's also kind of an interesting data analysis case study, right? So what Matt and Takashi did is they broke this down into two different properties. Okay, so um, the first property is like a phrase, okay? So when we try and formulate that statistically, what we'll be looking at specifically is how all the words come together. <clears throat> um, the other thing they look at is informativeness, all right? So how much does that phrase capture the key ideas in some set of documents, all right? So this is relative to the main, all right? Um, so one thing that opened up the problem a little bit and said, well, just having a set of documents from this domain isn't enough. I need to understand how this domain is different from all the other domains that we might have, right? So they introduced the notion of a background corpus, all right? So a background corpus is, you know, some very large corpus of sort of everything that people might say, right? And the foreground corpus is the set of documents about your specific domain. So maybe you have a few thousand documents about, you know, Honda Civics, but you know, you could also have like you know millions of documents that are scraped from forums of all sorts of products all over the world. Okay. So what we basically want to do is we want to measure these two properties: phraseness and informativeness. Okay. Um, so they're going to start with a couple of statistical tests. Um, so uh, let me talk about those. These are actually things that are very useful to know about. So uh, so this first one is called um, BLRT, binomial ratio likelihood test. Uh, it's actually not all that widely used, but it's a very robust, um, easy to uh, implement little test. So um, <clears throat> a binomial is basically the parameter for a coin flip, right? It's the, it's the generation, it's um, the statistical distribution where there's two outcomes. Um, so you have heads or tails, you succeed or fail. And the parameters of a binomial, of a sample of binomial, the sufficient statistics will just be the number of times you toss the coin, the number of times it came up heads. So, we're going to compare two statistics, so we basically have two sets of sufficient statistics. So we did n1 draws, and we got k1 heads, n2 draws, and k2 heads. All right. And the question we want to ask is, does it look like these were taken from one binomial, okay, or does it look like they were taken from two separate, different, statistically different binomials, okay? So. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to define P to be the sum of K1 and K2 divided by N1 and N2. So that's the maximum likelihood estimate of the probability for binomial. If it was just one binomial, and these were just two samples drawn from that binomial, right? And then these are 
the estimates if there were two separate binomials, P1 and P2. Okay. Um, the likelihood, and we could, I'm dropping like some of the combinations and permutations because they'll cancel out, is basically um, uh, uh, this quantity right here. So it's P to the K times 1 minus P to the N minus K. All right. So that's the likelihood of seeing that particular sample um, with this parameter P. Okay. Um, so um, now we're basically going to look at the ratio of two things. Okay. So the thing on the top is basically, well, there are two different distributions. So the chance of seeing um, uh, the, this outcome with two different dis distributions is just probability of getting this sample um, with the first distribution and the MLE estimate, and the, then the probability of the second um, distribution. All right, so that's that's if that's the probability um, the light the probability if you'd seen the, um, the if these were taken from two distinct binomials, um, and this is the probability if they were taken from the same binomial. All right, so there's the same parameter p, and once you got k1 n1, once you got k2 n2. Okay, um, so this is basically the test. Um, we could do a fancier Bayesian version of this, but this is what the BLRT thing does. Um, uh, and we actually look at the log of this. Um, uh, so we'll look at this number instead. Uh, and not, I don't remember why two times the log, but traditionally it's written that way. Okay, so we're looking at the log of this ratio. That's our test. And what is this telling us whether two um, uh, distributions are the same or not? Okay, or whether they look the same or not. Um, so let's look at um, informativeness. So I've got a phrase x, y, all right, and I've got two corpora. So C is my foreground corpus, and B is the background corpus, all right. What I want to look in here is basically, you know, is it um, to get something um, in the foreground corpus versus the background corpus, right? So is this phrase distributed differently in those two corpora, okay? So we basically count the number of bigrams in the foreground corpus and how many of them are x, y, right? And then the same thing for the background. You know, do they occur at the same frequency or not using this test? Okay. So this is measuring informativeness. All right. How much this is sort of a domain-specific concept. Um, so um, the other thing is to basically figure out how much this is a phrase. So here again, we're measuring two different um, probabilities or two different distributions, all right? Uh, and what we're basically doing here is we're basically saying, well, what's the distribution of y occurring in the foreground corpus um, after x versus any other place, okay? Um, so after x, there's you know, n times that x occurs, right? n1 times that x occurs, and k1 of those were, was actually the bigram x, y, all right? And then you can do the same thing where basically, you know, you had a y that wasn't after an x, all right? So again, we can do that same test that will tell us something about how, like, how, um, how, uh, how correlated those two words are, okay? So does y occur at the same frequency after x as in other positions? Um, so this gives us two signals, but we want to combine them. So um, what Matt and Takashi did first was they basically built a little, um, a little classifier where they weighted these things. And they, they told you there's basically just two weights, right? One for phrasiness and one for informativeness and then an intercept term. Um, and they basically used a bunch of news group data and then a bunch of movie data. So this is an old paper, so this is from 2002, OK? Um, and um, here's sort of an example of what they got. Uh, so you may not remember these movies because this is like so old. Um, but uh, yeah, or Born Identity, they're still making those, right? Julia Roberts, I guess she's still around? I'm not sure. Uh, Star Wars, Minority Report, uh, Box Office, Star Trek, okay. Scooby-Doo, Austin Power. So, so these are the phrases, so these are things that come up as both sort of being meaningful um, in a phrase sense, um, and um, also being um, informative, meaning representative of this domain. 
And of course, you get some artifacts, right? So you get things like frequent posters, right? So this guy, I guess, always started his messages off with, hey, and you know, here's Metro Day, something, something. So this is, this is a frequent phrase, but it's not really semantically meaningful. Um, uh, so uh, this is one measure that they looked at. Um, uh, another one uh, is uh, also, I think, kind of pretty intuitive, at least in retrospect. Um, so uh, uh, we want to look at these distributions and see how different they are. Okay. Um, so one possibility is um, to estimate phrases with a language model that, that describes bigrams versus a unigram model. So see how different a bigram versus a unigram model is. And then informativeness, we want to estimate phrase probability with the foreground versus the background corpus. So uh, we've turned these things into estimating the difference between two distributions and um, uh, estimating uh, and estimating basically bigram and unigram language models. Okay, so these are kind of primitives. We sort of have you know we can get routines from the internet to do both of these things. Um, so the kind of standard way of comparing conver uh, distributions is something called KL divergence. So if P and Q are distributions, then uh, this is a very common way of um, measuring the degree to which they're different. If they're exactly the same, then you know the log of one is zero, right? So this uh, turns out to be a very low number. If they're wildly different, this will be a very large number. Um, so they look at a variation of this they call pointwise KL divergence. So this tells you, it gives you one number that tells you how different two distributions are. What I really want to care about here is if I'm looking at, say, two distributions of phrases, one from the foreground and one from the background, I want to find out, well, what are the things that make those distributions seem really different? What are the phrases that contribute a lot to this aggregate quantity, right? So they basically look at um, the performance for, for a particular event W. The pointwise KL divergence is the probability of that W under P times this quantity. So it's just the contribu contribution of that one point W uh, KL divergence, all right? So this is another test, and you can sort of plug it in just the way you use um, uh, um, BLRT. So um, for uh, so we, we basically have a couple of different things here. We have a bigram, uh, unigram model, so the probability of x and y is just the product of those two probabilities, and a bigram model where first we generate x and we generate y given x. So we've got a conditional probability that we have to estimate here. All right. So phraseness is basically the difference between uh, the bigram and foreground model, and we're going to look at this pointwise KL divergence. Um, and then um, informativeness is basically the difference between the foreground and background models. Um, uh, and you could use either the unigram model or you could use the bigram model. Um, one kind of clever way of combining these is to look at these two things together. So we can look at the difference between the n-gram model in the foreground versus the unigram model in the background. Um, so there's like sort of a little picture. So um, phrasiness sort of is, is this measure when you go from unigrams to n-grams. And this is sort of when you go from the background to the foreground. Um, OK. So there's some discussions uh, as to like the various um, pros and cons. So this, uh, they argue basically this is a little bit um, you know, more intuitive, and it can sort of exploit language modeling resources a little bit better. Um, uh, so, you know, for engineering reasons, this is a little bit nicer. Um, uh, if you look at the actual results, um, I don't think there's sort of a subjective difference. So you can't look at this and sort of say, oh, well, that's much better than the old one, um, or much worse. They seem to be pretty comparable. Um, So this was an assignment in this class for a few years. Um, we're not doing it this year because I wanted to just kind of squeeze some other stuff in. Um, but it's a nice, um, uh, it's a nice example. Um, so phrases are sort of where this bag of words representation that we use all the time in supervised learning starts to break. Um, uh, it's an example of working on an unsupervised learning problem. So. We want to come up with some t statistics to capture some intuitions, and it's sort of a nice description of, of, of doing that. Um, and um, 
It's also nice, you know, if I want as a kind of level of complexity um, for a MapReduce pipeline. So you could write this as a MapReduce pipeline in um, just raw Hadoop, and it sort of gives you an idea as to why that's complicated. Um, you can thank me if you like, but I'm not making you do that this year. Um, instead, we're just talking about this algorithm, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to through an implementation of this um, uh, in guinea pig. So I have to say, um, uh, well, there's two things in this slide deck. The one I'm going to go through is the guinea pig implementation, because you guys are grinding on that away on that now. Um, there's a longer um, slide deck, which is um, walking through an implementation in pig. And I'm going to skip that. Um, uh, uh, but um, I did this like just last night. OK, so this is a little bit raw. There may be, there may be bugs or surprises here. Um, no, it, it kind of works on a small case, but I haven't really done much with it. Um, OK, so let's step through the thing. So the first thing we have to do is for our unigrams, we have to do word count, all right? So um, I think I've actually shown you word count things in guinea pig, right? So this little function takes a, as an argument its corpus. And it generates the little x, you know, the, the view definition that will do a word count over that. Okay, so you read the lines, you flatten, and then you group and count. Okay, um, so we're going to do this for the background corpus and a foreground corpus. So uh, in my experiments, the background corpus is the brown corpus, which is the oldest and smallest kind of general English corpus, maybe a few million words. Um, and then uh, I think it was about a million words of uh, a liberal news group from a few years back. OK, uh, so these are all about like, you know, left wing politics in the US. All right. Um, so this is pretty simple. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to count phrases. So my phrases are all going to be bigrams. I'm not going to consider like three word phrases or anything complicated like that. So um, uh, it's basically the same code, except here, instead of generating tokens with this function, I'm going to generate um, uh, bigrams. Oh, here, here's some output. This is the tail of the output here. So these are, you know, counts for some of the words. So zone happened twice, for example. Um, so here is now a function which generate bigrams. Oh, and it's bigrams, and I'm throwing out bigrams that contain a stop word, right? So, um, uh, so the stop words are kind of the most common function words of and the, you know, a couple, a couple hundred very common um, words that we know sort of don't have any strong semantic meaning, so we can discount the phrases that contain those. So this basically generates a bunch of phrases um, that don't have stop words, and we're doing exactly the same thing. So now we have a count of phrases. All right. Now the next thing to do is move data around. Okay. So what I want is to be able to stream through the list of phrases, and for each phrase, I need all the info. I want to get information like the number of times it occurs in foreground and background, the number of times the first word occur occurs in foreground and background, the number of times the second word occurs in foreground and background. So um, I've got all those numbers, but I don't have them in one place. All right. Um, oh, I forgot to show you this. Yeah, so here are some examples of things. So Democratic Party happens four times, uh, for example. Um, OK, so um, what I'm going to do since, you know, essentially what I'm doing here is I'm accumulating a lot, a lot of statistics. I could put them all in a tuple, but it gets a little awkward when the tuple has like five or six or eight different things in it. Um, uh, so instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in a dictionary. Um, and the main operation I want to do is basically add one more statistic to my dictionary of statistics. Okay. So my dictionary is going to have you know, the name of a statistic and its value. So it's going to map the name to a value. And the name's just going to be a string. All right. And my main operation here is I'm going to take an old dictionary and a key value pair, and I'll add a new thing in. Right. And I'm, I'm going to do this non-destructively. Right. So I'm, I'm not going to modify the dictionary. I'll copy it. Uh, so here's what this looks like. So I'm going to start out, um, I'm going to start out with a join to get the foreground and background counts together. All right. And then I'll construct a little dictionary that just has those two entries. All right. Then I'm going to go through here. Um, and I'm going to get the counts for the first word in the phrase. OK. Um, so I've got this um, object here. Um, and I'm going to join this with the foreground word count. OK. So I'm pulling out the first word of the phrase here. 
um, x and the word for the word count, all right, will basically sort of take this new structure that I've created and basically just stick those, that new statistic into the word count thing. Um, then I'm going to do the same thing for the background counts for x. All right. So this is, uh, uh, and then finally I'm going to do the same thing for the, um, the, the second argument y here. All right. OK. So, um, so this pulls together all the statistics about the phrase and um, uh, the words that are contained in that phrase. All right. Um, so what's the next thing I need to do? This is a lot like your kind of naive Bayes assignment. What else do I need to do? So I want to get some sort of probability. So like what's the probability of x, right? What do I need to get that probability? I've got to count. So when you're doing naive Bayes and you're like looking at the event probabilities, right? What's the thing you need beside the event counts? Yeah, right. The the marginals, the total counts, right? So we got to get the total counts. Okay. Um, so um, so this is getting the total number of phrases, um, I guess, in the background. All right. Um, and I want to actually um, point out. So um, so in guinea pig it doesn't do much unless you tell it to, right? So this grouping construct is designed so that you can kind of control exactly how a MapReduce gets set up kind of declaratively, all right? So it turns out for this particular thing, for a large corpus, it really matters how you do this, okay? So if I, if I drop this last line with the one that's underlined in green, then that's totally correct. It'll work fine on my little test cases, okay? And when I run it on a big problem, it will take a long time, right? This particular operation is going to take a long time, all right? So why is that? So let's think about what's happening under the hood, okay, when we do this map reduce, all right? We're starting with our phrases. So we've got, you know, a gazillion phrases. They've got numbers associated with each of them. I do this map operation where essentially I'm just replacing this phrase with a constant, okay? So now I basically, you know, essentially just have a whole bunch of numbers, right? Okay. Um, and then I'm going to reduce these, okay? So at the end of the day, I want to have one total, okay? So at the end of the day, I want to have all this stored in one file, all right? The way to do that in a, with a map reduce process is to set the number so I have one reducer, okay? I want to have one reducer here. Because at the end of the day, I just want to get a single count for everything. All right? Um, so um, if I have one reducer, let's kind of think about what's going on, right? So for every phrase, there's going to be one line in this map. All right? Those lines aren't going to be compressed in any way. They're all going to be shuffle sorted, and they're going to be sent to that one reducer. OK? So there's no memory problems here, OK? Right? Um, you know, the reducer is going to just kind of keep a running total as it goes down. There's just one big block of things. They're all the same key constant, right? Um, so there are no memory problems, but it's going to have to scan through the whole list of phrases, right? So that's inefficient, okay? Um, so the, um, the thing that kind of comes to our rescue here is combiners, okay? So if I do combiners as well, okay, what happens is, um, I do this map, if I do the combines locally on the, those separate machines, then what's going to happen? So this list of things is all going to get combined to one number, right? And the same thing for every other one, right? There's only one key in this output. And after we um, finish with it at the map worker, OK, there'll just be one sum, which will be the total sum of all the uh, phrase, not count of the total um, phrases in that map, OK? So now. There is one reducer at the end, but it's one reducing. It's just, it's just, it's just mapping. It's just reducing a, 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 a handful of lines. Okay, so there's one line for each mapper that in this thing. So, um, 
it will be much more efficient to do combiners here. This is sort of an extreme case where combining is like sort of a huge win. Is that, is that clear to people? I have a question. So yeah. For homework two, I was trying to use combiner to reduce the cost in memory, but, uh, uh, but conversely, the memory cost is even higher. So what could be the potential cost? Um, so you're trying to use the, well, so the combiner doesn't work in memory. It's like another reduced process, right? It's another streaming process, right? So you're using it to reduce memory? Or to yeah. put things in memory. Um, to reduce the memory. So um, the memory depends on how, how large the list when you do the sorting, right? So yeah. when you're doing stream and sort, yeah. uh, like running it locally. Um, running locally. Um, or you're running it on Hadoop. So locally. Let's take this offline. Talk to me after class. Okay. Okay. Um, I think, right? Um, so if you're doing it locally, I think what you're asking is, what's the um, guinea pig way of doing the thing analogous to the buffering, right? Where you sort of store things in a hash table, right? So you can do that. Um, what you need to do is you need to um, set up a, both a buffer locally in the mapper, okay? And then in the map, you're adding to that buffer and outputting it at the end. And then when you, when you finish the map, you have to do a teardown and, and, and um, output everything. So you can do that in guinea pig. And you can do that in Spark, right? And uh, the magic um, routine is a variation of map called map partitions, OK? So in map partitions, you're basically you're iterating. You're, you have sort of control of the beginning and end of the, the um, iteration. Um, but um, it's, it's a slightly clumsy way of, it's purely functional, but it's slightly clum clumsy way of doing it. So look at the map partition things, I think is a short answer, if that's the way you want, if you want to do that. Um, okay, so we're going to count up the number of foreground and background um, phrases uh, the same way. Um, and now I just need to sort of add those in. Um, so here's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, so we can do a map side join, okay? So we take these phrases and we make them side views. Um, and then we, we have to write a little routine that will load those side views in, all right? And then what comes out is um, the original thing, this phrase stats two object, which has a phrase and a bunch of statistics, and then the, uh, the two totals that I've computed, all right? Uh, so these are duplicated for every line in that, uh, in that map. Um, so I just need to extend the statistics with those two extra um, values, uh, and I'm done. Um, or if I want to do it um, uh, with a, um, with a um, uh, reduced side join, I can do it this way, right? So I can just do an explicit join operation here, okay? So now the final thing to do is actually do the computation. So here are the routines we need in Python to do that little um, um, uh, pointwise KL divergence computation. I'm, I'm using a little bit of smoothing here. Um, but otherwise, it's basically, uh, it's basically kind of just what's in the paper. Um, so um, uh, at the end of the day, I basically take the phrase, and instead of having this big pile of statistics, I just have the information um, score and the phrase score. So that's basically what, uh, what we do. Um, so here are some results. So these are the top you know, 10 or 12 things. Um, uh, uh, so I'm pretty sure this implementation is working, because this is similar to what we get. Uh, out of like uh, pig, as far as I could tell. Um, so uh, not all of these are like ideal. So right wing, vast majority, it's fine. Some of these things are informal things that I think probably we would want to take out with more of a stop word filter. But you know, press release, voting machines, school districts, national security, these are all sort of nice um, uh, semantic phrases. Um, if we just look at the phrasiness and not the informativeness, um, then here's, um, here's the top few things. I took it a little bit further down. So these red things basically um, are on this list because they have, they're really good phrases, um, but they're not um, informative for this domain, OK? So things like soap opera and cocktail circuit and aircraft carrier and loved ones, right? So they occur very um, uh, systematically together, OK? Um, but 
they're not specific. They're not highly specific to this domain. Um, so they're not informative, but they are, they are, are nice and phrasy. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, it also seems like, I guess this is um, uh, a slightly different list. So this is just, just look, ranking things by phrasiness. Um, uh, this is looking at the top 100 things by phrasiness and then picking the ones that are least informative. So years ago, um, make sure is very non-informative, so on and so forth. Okay. So these are things that shouldn't be you know, political terms. Um, and here's the last one. These are ones that are informative but are not phrasy. So these are in the top 100 list of informative things. Um, security does way different new legislation, didn't believe doing it, time sets. These are not good phrases, according to this heuristic. Um, and then finally, this is the full pipeline. It doesn't all fit on one slide, sadly. Um, so it's a three slide pipeline. Okay, uh, questions? All right. Um, this is the stack of um, pigs. So this is kind of like my old lecture. I'm not going to go through this, but I'll point out one thing um, uh, in this um, stack. Um, really, it's pretty much the same algorithm. Um, uh, the one thing that's uh, kind of different and uh, new here is um, the actual computation. Okay. So computing phrasiness, um, it probably actually could do this in raw pig, but for the purpose of the examples, I basically sh um, put together this slide to show you how you would add a um, user-defined function to pig. All right. So if I want to add a new function to pig, there's an API for doing this. So I can define this eval function func thing if I import the right packages. All right. Um, and you know, the key thing I have to do is I basically have to take the arguments and unpack them, figure out what types they are, okay, um, and then do my final computation and return it. So this is, this is sort of the machinery you have to put in, right? So this is arguing that, this is checking that you have exactly six arguments to this function. Um, and then when I call it from pig, at the end of the day, I'll be doing something like this, right? So I've got these, um, these are just fields of the, um, the, the record I'm using as input here in phrase stats. I, I didn't use a dictionary here. So these are the names of the fields. And we're just calling this function a couple of times to get two different values. All right. So, uh, so, so this is what you have to do. And to, to access your, um, your user-defined function, you have to stick it in a jar file and make sure it's distributed to the workers and so on and so forth, um, which, which you do with this register command. So, so this is the pipeline uh, in pig, and it's a little bit more compact if you don't count the fact that I uh, have this extra Java file. OK, so that's what I have for today. Um, I will talk to you on Tuesday. I can maybe answer your question now. Um, all right. Oh, and um, if you came in late and you're on the wait list, you need to fill out this forbidding looking form. Um, uh, I've got one with your name on it that's already signed. So come get it. I was, I've seen the reduce in